So in terms of what we're trying to do today, where we see this series of key debates, and this is the first one and we expect there'll be others, is that it's really fitting into the capacity building element of the Centre for Global Higher Education. So we see capacity building in two senses. There's the fairly much more common sense of how do you develop and build the capacity of emerging researchers and established researchers in the field of higher education. But there's a second sense in terms of how do you build the capacity of higher education research? How do you enable higher education research or how do you be part of supporting higher education research to have more robust conversations with policymakers, with practitioners and with students? How do you build its capacity to do that? And we see these key debate seminars as a way of doing that, as a way of bringing together researchers from higher education, but also researchers from other fields, other disciplines who research higher education, but are actually in conversation with people from their field rather than in conversation with higher education researchers. <coughs> and one of the challenges for higher education research is that its body of knowledge is quite fragmented across a number of fields, a number of disciplines. And so what we're trying to do across these seminars is to focus on one particular issue and get a number of different voices, both within higher education research and people within academia, but outside higher education research, and to try and see what we can learn together and how we can take those ideas forward. So, as um, Mark's already mentioned, the focus of this key debate seminar is about what is global about higher education um, and why does it matter? And I think clearly, if you call yourself the Global Center for Higher Education, um, you're setting yourself a challenge. You know, you're immediately begging the question, well, what does global mean in this context? So for us as a center, this is a really important question to ask and to problematize. It's also something that it's really important for higher education to give systematic thought to in a context where increasingly globalization is seen as a virtual synonym for neoliberalism. Globalization means the moral imperative to create markets. That's what we should be doing. How do we develop other meanings of globalization? How do we make it not simply mean neoliberalism and mean something else? And as well as that pressure towards globalization, meaning neoliberal, we also have, or we're also in a moment where increasingly the notion of being global citizen is being closed down and being positioned as being a citizen of nowhere. So again, we've got these dual forces that in fact are probably enhancing each other and probably in many ways have a very clear shared agenda. So how do we reposition the global so it means something that to us is more powerful, more meaningful, and allows us to do the work we want to do and to make the arguments that we want to do. And it's that that we're really focusing on um, today. So as you'll see in the programme, we've got a series of panels and discussions of people from inside higher education research, people outside higher education research, thinking about those questions. And what we'd like you to do as participants is to really think about, OK, how am I positioned within that? Where does my work go? How can I continue this discussion and debate as we go forward? So that's really what the agenda is for today. Now, all of the contributions we have this morning are from an academic perspective. We're really grateful to the... Um, you know, speakers and the quality of what they've got to offer, and we're so grateful for them coming here to share that with us. And they're all academically focused. So where we want to start today, though, is views from within higher education, but outside those academic debates. How do other actors within the field of higher education understand the notion of globalization and how it impacts on their work? So where we're going to start is we contacted a number of actors in the higher education sector and we asked them to answer two questions. So why did they, how did they see the impact of global higher education and what's their role or aim in relation to that in terms of their organisation? How is their organisation um, engaging with that agenda? So... We've got a series of actors who, as I say, are 
part of higher education but aren't engaging with these questions as part of an academic debate. So we have the European Universities Association, um, which is an organisation representing universities across Europe. It has 850 members across 47 countries that in total bring together an, around 17 million students. So they see themselves as the voice of European universities. So how do they understand globalisation? We then have a contribution from Cardiff Metropolitan University, a university that clearly positions themselves as focused on students' in employability and improving the student experience. And what they have is students from over 140 different countries. So for them, how are they positioning globalisation? How does that relate to what they're trying to do as an organisation? Then we have QS that's very much positioned as providing information for both higher education and career development. How do they understand the notion of globalisation, being one of the most visible producers of university rankings, global university rankings? Then we have um, Parthenon EY, who are a consultancy who are focused on developing strategies. Um, you'll see I'm, not, <laughs> I'm looking at my paper here because we, we've, the things I'm giving you are from the web websites of these organisations. And so Parthenon described themselves as a strategy consultancy and looking at actionable strategies for real impact in today's complex business landscape. That's a language I'm less familiar with, which is why I'm relying much more on my notes to it. But it's equally important to understand how they position globalisation, how that relates to them as an institution. And then finally, we have ISEF, who are a private company who bring together international educators, industry service providers, and student recruitment agents in order to support the recruitment of students to higher education. Um, for the first four contributions, we have videos from, from the organizations. For the fifth video, they sent us slides, and you'll find that those slides are voiced by a very interesting actor. Um, I'll say no more than that at this stage. Um, so now we'll move on to have a look at the videos. What is the impact of globalization on higher education and research? It's been a good one. Generally, globalization has been a good thing for universities. It's linked to really big mega trends we've seen in the last decades. It's linked to the facility of doing free trade, things we don't actually normally connect with higher education, like standardized containers or market set currency rates. What they've meant is that you need to compete on the knowledge you can create in your society. So you need to move up the, the value chain. You need to make your people more educated and more able to compete in this globalized world where we can send things around the globe with, with great ease. And you've seen that, you've seen that very clearly. Bigger role for universities and society in general, very clearly in the massive growth in student numbers, the massive growth in investments in research and development. You might say, yes, this is not going so well at the moment. We can see some cuts here and there. But as a mega trend, if you look over the decades, it's been a massive investment in private sector and in public sector. So that's been a good thing. These things can only be a good thing for universities. The other good thing is, of course, that it's made travel and exchange of information much easier across the globe so that we can actually have these mega infrastructures that are truly global also meant that science can be truly global and we can share data across the world. So that's good. But we know that free competition also creates concentration and that there is an issue of capacity in higher education and research to be concentrated in a few hubs around the world. There is the North Atlantic hegemony of Europe and the United States plus Japan. It's not really been broken but even in the places like Brazil or China, where we have seen a, a new hops growing, they are extremely concentrated. That also means brain drain. That means that good researchers, good teachers from, let's say, the periphery of these areas where research and higher education are strong, they move around and they move to the hops. And that is an issue. So yes, globalization, it's been a good thing 
been a very good thing, but is not without its drawbacks. And those drawbacks are concentration and brain, and, and brain drain, absolutely. Now, what is the aim of the European University Association in this context? So we represent about 850 institutions around Europe. We do a lot of international work. We've been very active globally in higher education and research. And our aim has been, oh, let's say, uh, slogan is universities for an open world. And you might say, yes, we have the open world, but the open world also needs to be inclusive. We need to have an inclusive research and higher education community. Uh, that means that people that need to expand their possibilities and need to realize themselves and their potential through higher education across the world need to have access to high quality higher education. And it doesn't matter where they are. They should have access to that anywhere. That means they don't need to quit their continent in order to really realize their potential. That's for the individuals. That's the kind of inclusive higher education society we would need. It also has to do with what higher education and research is for, the, the academic engagement with knowledge and creation of knowledge should not be reduced to a few areas around the world. We need people that can engage with technical issues that are relevant for their particular region and not just the issues that we like to, to research in, in the hops that goes for science and technology the particular uh, solutions that can be brought to specific regions. It also goes for social science and humanities, that you have an academic engagement with the cultural tra traditions around the world and not just with, let's say, the Anglo-Saxon or the, the Francophone tradition. And then we leave a large part of the, the human culture without any academic engagement. That is a really big pity and it, it doesn't correspond to the richness of the world that we're living in. EUA would like to see an open world. An open world means a, an inclusive research and higher education community. Good morning. I, I was asked to answer two questions uh, for the seminar. The first question is, what do I think uh, the impact of globalization on higher education is? There are, there are many social, economic and cultural challenges facing higher education in the UK, such as the unfavorable demographic trends, immigration, ethnic and religious tensions, but more importantly, the inequalities imposed by globalization, which contributed to the increasing wave of nationalist, populist, anti-immigration and anti-globalization trends happening around us. While these challenges represent a threat, uh, they also raise the awareness of the importance for the higher education sector to develop a meaningful response. In my view, there are two main impacts of globalization on higher education. On the positive side, globalization brings people together through mobility, joint research, joint degrees, transnational education, cross-border learning and borderless degree. Some would argue that this is simply not possible to achieve a high level of excellence in higher education without being an open and a global university. On the other side, it is feared that globalization could lead to uniformity of the global higher education system. In other words, the standardization of higher education as a result of globalization could affect the national identity of universities. The emerging concept of a global university is perceived to be, possible, uh, to be a possible response to both impacts. A global university is a university which has a global identity with global citizens and a global system. However, geographically, uh, uh, this could be located in any country, which by itself is a response to the national identity uh, uh, of the university concerns. As for the second question, some would argue that the society is polarized as a result of the populist trends. In the UK, it's taking back control versus global Britain. Universities have a duty to bridge the so-called polarization. In my view, by working on meeting its local responsibilities, 
serving its local communities, but at the same time maintaining and growing its international presence. It's not an either-or situation. The question here is how can we bring the benefits of internationalization to our local communities? Cardiff Metropolitan University has been very successful with its current internationalization strategy 2012 to 2017. We are now in the process of developing our new strategy 2017 to 22, which will focus on ethical internationalization. So it's not internationalism, not internationalization, but ethical internationalization. We aim, we aim to educate for global citizenship with attributes such as openness and understanding of other world views, empathy to people from other backgrounds, and the capacity to value diversity to develop mutually beneficial relationships and partnerships, to be a vital means in achieving global civic engagement, global responsibility and social justice, to, a, to promote uh, education that is equitable, inclusive and less elitist, not only by focusing predominantly on mobility, but more on the curricula and the learning outcomes. For example, the, uh, the abroad component, the mobility, needs to be an integral part of internationalized curricula to ensure that internationalization is for all, not only for a mobile minority. So it goes beyond students' recruitment, it goes beyond transnational education. Although internationalization is important to the financial stability of higher education institutions, it shouldn't be a goal for itself, but the means to enhancing quality, students' experience, and employability. So we are aiming to achieve the three objectives in everything we do. A market-oriented objective, the academic objective, and the humanitarian objective. One of the main priorities in our new strategic plan is to develop the Cardiff Global Initiative to signify that we are an international university that celebrates its roots in Wales. The Cardiff Global Initiative will develop, number one, global academies, which will deliver interdisciplinary, international, and impactful postgraduate and research provision. And on the other hand, the Cardiff Open Colleges, which will deliver progression routes into the university by partnering with schools and colleges across Wales and the UK, fostering civic engagement in the Cardiff capital region. In other words, using the Cardiff Global Initiative to bring internationalization benefits to local communities through linking our global academies to the Cardiff Open Colleges, a pipeline from international to local communities. What do you think is the impact of globalization on higher education? So today we're in a very global environment and businesses think globally. Uh, I think the two most important impacts that globalization has had on higher education is one, international student mobility, and two is international research collaboration. Um, now, globalization has allowed candidates and students to think internationally, and it is reflected in some of the numbers that we're seeing uh, come through. So, according to uh, ICEF Monitor, between 2000 and 2014, the number of students studying outside of their home country doubled from 2.1 million to nearly 5 million in 2015. Um, and the international tertiary education market is estimated to be nearly at 8 million by 2025, which is nearly a 60% growth, and that's estimated by OECD uh, in the next decade. Student numbers have actually forced universities to think internationally. And I don't just refer to this as the student recruitment efforts, but also as an attempt to, uh, to increase the international research collaboration. So if you look at um, the research done between 2004 and 2014, if you measure it by the number of international collaborations, uh, from 15.1%, from it grew to about 18.3%. And this does not, this is just an overall stat. If you measure the scientific discipline alone, uh, th those numbers have grown proportionally much higher. Um, so in between 2011 and 2016, 43% uh, of scientific papers written were written with international collaborators. Um, and in some countries, these collaborations go over 60%. Uh, so to name a few, Switzerland, Singapore, and these, these sort of benchmark you know, the, the role of uh, international research in higher ed. What's your role or aim in relation to globalization of higher education? 
So at the heart of what we do is our mission statement, which is basically enabling motivated individuals in fulfilling their potential by fostering international mobility, career development, and educational achievement. And our role predominantly is to help them make that right decision. So how we do this is, is via a couple of routes. One of them is events. So we go to over 70 countries holding over 300 events every year, connecting over 200,000 candidates in person with institutions from around the world. And this is at all levels, from undergraduate, masters, MBA, all through. Uh, then we have one of, our, one of the world's largest uh, education portals in topuniversities.com. Uh, one of the big areas of information that it provides is the rankings that we produce. So this actually gives candidates qualified information that helps them make that decision. Our world university rankings are shaped by and shape the notion of higher education as a global enterprise by featuring two measures of internationalization, international faculty and international student ratios. Uh, the rankings recognize that internationalization is at the heart of the institutional strategy for so many institutions and also implicitly recognizes that internationalization is a meaningful metric in, which can be measured by quality that is delivered. On topuniversities.com, you can find the rankings, you can find other student experiences, information about you know, universities from around the world, and also scholarships and funding information. Reimagine Education, uh, one of the conferences that we run, provides an environment for educational thought leaders from across the world to come together to share best practices, collaborate, and forge international connections. Um, by doing all of this, our goal is to be a promoter of international higher education. Uh, we ensure that, we're, that any capable individual who wants to enhance their credentials, their experiences, or networks by studying abroad are able to do so. And we also aim that universities that wish to think globally are able to do so. At Parthenon, we're fortunate enough to work with a range of investors, operators, and regulators in higher education uh, across the world. And the impact of uh, globalization and internationalization in higher education impacts three stakeholder groups broadly. Um, for students, it provides them with a phenomenal opportunity for global mobility. For many of them, it's uh, their first chance to live abroad for an extended period of time. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to bring back skills to their home market that they wouldn't have had had they gone to university domestically. For example, in China, there are about half a million students that go abroad every year, and that number is growing by about 15% every year. As well as creating a more diverse student and faculty body, globalization has helped a number of universities with their finances. In universities in Australia, many of them will have international student intakes of about 20 to 25 percent, and they provide a rich source of income for public universities who are increasingly constrained by the financial situations they're facing. Globalization has also helped a number of universities move abroad. In cities such as Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, Abu Dhabi, and Doha have been hotbeds of international education and have created ecosystems that allow universities to come up and set up their establishments quite efficiently and effectively. Internationalization has also created a number of business opportunities for operators and investors. And we've seen the emergence of industries and businesses in test preparation that help students prepare for their uh, entry exams into foreign universities. We've seen the emergence of agent counseling businesses that support students with their visa applications and their choice of university and the degree that they should be undertaking. We've also seen the emergence of the pathway provider. These are multi-million dollar businesses that provide a one-year pathway program in conjunction with a university to help students who are not quite there in terms of their academic performance or maybe their English proficiency to have a one-year program that allows them to get into the university of their choice. And these companies include the likes of Navitas, Study Group, Cambridge Education Group, into to name a few. Well, higher education is a very capital-intensive business, wherever you do it in the world. And international higher education requires capital inflows. 
Our role at Parthenon is to support governments, investors, institutions with the right advice backed up by very strong data to help them make the right decisions on which markets to enter, which courses to offer, and how can you satisfy students' changing needs for international education. Globalization creates an urgency for academic institutions to be catalysts for helping their students, and indeed their countries, to compete and thrive in today's interconnected world. Top higher education institutions are rightly understood to be bridges across cultures and key drivers of knowledge-based economies. The vast majority of leading academic institutions today are engaged in three levels of internationalisation because doing so is increasingly seen as a commitment to excellence and relevancy. At the personal level, instructors adapt their teaching approach to account for a wide range of cultural perspectives and experiences, and scholars do the same when it comes to their research. At the faculty or departmental level, academic units internationalise their curriculum and reach out to form new partnerships with colleagues abroad. And finally, at the institutional level, the institution extends its influence, partnerships and scholarly contributions across borders and encourages cross-cultural engagement in its local community. Virtually everything ISEF does is concerned with helping institutions to become more international. We help institutions to build effective international partnerships via our networking events taking place all over the world. We publish the latest international research and market intelligence in the field via our online medium, ISEF Monitor. We provide mentoring and training services on internationalisation for educators. We deliver courses to international education agents who are interested in being recognised as meeting the highest industry quality standards and becoming specialists in particular markets. All these efforts are designed to help international educators to meet their internationalisation goals as effectively and efficiently as possible and to be able to respond to rapidly changing market conditions. Okay, so we'd like to thank um, those five organisations for giving us their contributions and their views of globalisation and their role within it. You know, that was really kind of them to give their time to do that and we really, really appreciate it. And what we'd like you to do with that is to think about the different positionings and meanings of global, the different ways those, those institutions saw their roles within it as we continue the debates and discussions today and bring those into relation to the more academic debates that we're about to move on to.